The world is as divided as it's ever been. We all see it or feel it. The hopelessness, confusion, frustration, the weariness. But it's times like these that matter most. Times like these where we have to decide exactly who we are, who we're going to be, what we're going to do. Where we have to decide, will we shut our doors, fence off our fields, look after our own? Or will we swing wide those doors? Make the whole of the earth our field. Celebrate what makes us different. Hold fast to what makes us one. To plant the seeds of peace, love, of hope. To reach deep with both our hands. And scatter those seeds like he told us to. Will we be the people God made us to be? The peacemakers, the lovers of the lost, the light of the world? Will we open our hands, our doors, our lives, our eyes, and work to bring this world what it's longing for? That is a really haunting melody, don't you think? Don't worry, anyone, I'm here now. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm, I'm stand-in today. Uh, Kevin's my friend. Uh, regardless of what we are to each other in sin, we are lovers of Jesus, and he lives in us, and we're friends, and I would live in Chicago. And I'm a teaching pastor at a church so much like yours, uh, except it snows in the winter there. All right. Uh, so I'm just glad to be here. I've been here for the scatter event. And in fact, we're doing a mini scatter in, in the central United States in Chicago at my church. And so uh, carrying on some of what you're doing here. God be with us today. And if you are visiting and even someone who's maybe just considering Christianity or you used to be a part of Christianity and now you wanna, you're kind of coming back wherever you're at, we're glad you're here today. My joy to be with you. All right, ready, set, go. Here we go. Long, long time ago, I was a church planter up in Walnut Creek. Not knew if I had the chance I could help my people dance if I could get them down to Mexico. And so, when our church started there, we decided we'd do our first missions trip to Mexico. And we filled two big 15 passenger vans with people. Sometimes they were family, sometimes they were singles. And off we went down to Mexico and sitting right behind me as I drove one of the 15 passenger vans was a woman, young woman, like 16 years old that I will call Sally. And Sally really wanted to go to Mexico. She didn't really care to do a mission to Mexico. You get the difference? All right. And you know, think of her now, don't want to caricature her too much, uh, blonde cheerleader type. Okay. <laughs> and 
a voice that was constantly yapping. All right, so she's right behind me. And, and she goes, oh, Pastor Lon, Pastor Lon, I'm so, so, so excited to go on this trip. And she had come with her father, and I didn't understand why he went in one van and she came in the other. And, uh, <laughs> and, and as we headed down through, you know, Modesto and heading south and waving at, at, at Monterey because we were on Highway 5 and, and over the grapevine, and as we started coming down into the L.A. Valley, she got so excited. Oh, oh, can we stop here? Oh, can we stop there? Oh, let's stop here. Oh, let's stop there. And, and I would go, Sally, we are going to Mexico to do a mission trip. <laughs> okay. Oh, 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 Disneyland, Disneyland. Can we stop at Disney? Can we stop? I knew why your dad was in the other van. Uh, <laughs> Shelly, No. We are going to Mexico to do a missions trip. Uh, San, Diego, San Diego Harbor. Oh, 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 yeah, it's so beautiful. Look at this. Look at that guy. You know, I don't know. No, no. <laughs> Shelly, we are going to Mexico to do a missions trip. Right, right, right. Okay. Well, about dusk that night, we crossed the border at Tijuana. Most of the people I had with me have never been in a place that was not a place of privilege, and now they were. And maybe it was the sun going down, but it was also the reality of what we saw. The palatial mansions of Southern California had been replaced by barely shacks, cardboard walls, hubcaps in the drive, and the van got eerily silent. And then Shelly, oh, her name was Sally. I wasn't going to tell you. <laughs> I did that in the first hour, too. It used to be it didn't matter wherever we spoke because we didn't have this thing called the Internet and everything going everywhere. But, man, I've gotten in trouble a good bit of the time. Uh, <laughs> Sally, all right. She was so quiet, we were all just deeply touched by what we were seeing and seeing needs in our world we didn't see before. And from the depths of her being, and it, it, it was a compassion that rose up, and she just cried out. She leans forward, she goes, Pastor Lon, we have to do something. And I thought, good, got her. This is exactly what Jesus is doing in our passage today. Two 15-passenger vans, James, John, Peter, uh, Simon, Bartholomew, they're all in there. And he knows the only way they're going to really catch it is to get out there and see it. And so open your Bibles with me, if you have them, please, to Matthew chapter 9, starting in verse 35 through 38. Shoreline Bible, page 9, really? I thought it was 974, but I could be wrong. Yeah, turn it on, open it up, yeah, and, and, and here we go. So imagine Jesus, here we go, 35 through 38, excuse me. Jesus went through all the towns and the villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. Thus ends the reading of the sacred text. The reason I use the illustration of Sally and the vans and going from Walnut Creek down to Mexico is that's what's happening here. Jesus has his disciples, and, and you see it, the second word of the passage, Jesus went. They didn't stay locked into Monterey and Carmel and Salinas, et cetera, et cetera, Pacific Grove. They, they got out of there, and Jesus took them to places where need was greater than they saw day in and day out. They went. When they went, the second verb is they saw. The third verb is they felt. They went, they saw, they felt. When you go, you will see. And if Jesus Christ lives in you, you'll start to feel what he feels for a lost world. 
That's how this begins. So off they go. They go to all the towns in the villages. You see that? One, two, three, four words into the first verse. They went to all the towns and the villages. All? Yes, all. And this is just the beginning of the allness of Jesus Christ. This is, this is missions trip one to the towns and the villages in, 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 around the Sea of Galilee. But the all of Jesus will spread beyond that. It'll spread up into Syria. It'll head throughout the whole Middle East. And by the time Jesus rises from the dead, he will say, go therefore into what? All nations, every ethnicity, every place, here, there, and everywhere, and bring the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 1, 8. He even strategically gets it tighter for them. He says, I want you to go to Jerusalem. I want you to go to Judea. I want you to go to Samaria. And I want you to go all over the world. The allness of Jesus as he goes on mission trips. <laughs> all right, so off they go. To the whole world is what we're called to. It's 2,000 years later. We still need to get in the 15 passenger vans and go. And that symbolizes our neighborhood. That symbolizes our workplace. That symbolizes our extended family. Wherever they live, we are called to go. And what do we go with? Look what it says here. It says, he was teaching in all the villages and proclaiming, and here it is, the good news of the kingdom. Okay? The good news of the kingdom. It's a good message. Now, sometimes when the term good news is used, which is also synonymous when we hear the term gospel, if, if you're starting to read the Bible at all, you're, you're running into this word gospel in different places. It means just good news. It's a message. It's a good message. The, it, sometimes it'll say the, the good news of God. Other times it'll say the good news of Jesus. This says the good news of what? What's it say? A kingdom. Uh, uh, the good news of of a civilization, the good news of a, of a new world order. You know, our world has changed drastically, hasn't it, in, in the last couple of weeks. And that's because the Chicago Cubs won the World Series. <laughs> Hallelujah, there is a God who reigns on high. It's been since 1908. The world has changed significantly since that event. Not going to talk about any of the others. All right. <laughs> but the kingdom of God launched here. Right here at that time. And the kingdom of God is pressing into every region of human existence. And you say, well, what is the good news of the kingdom? What is the gospel of the kingdom? Here's the definition I'd like to give to you today. The gospel of the kingdom is the message of God's promise to make everything wrong in us and the world right because of Jesus Christ. We're going to leave that on the screen for you. There's dense theology there that we're not going to spend much time with. But let me just kind of highlight it. It is the gospel of a kingdom, of a new world order, of a new civilization. And God promises through that to make everything wrong inside me, Lon Allison, and you make it right. But not just us. The whole world's going to start getting better. Do any of you uh, like the Chronicles of Narnia and C.S. Lewis and all that stuff? We call him St. Louis in Chicago. Have you, have you seen, how many of you have seen or read uh, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe? Good, good, good. You must be good to people. All right, so the whole notion of it being a land where it's always winter and never what? Christmas. Holy mackerel. I live in a real winter world. We, we would, Chicago wouldn't exist without Christmas. Because they gave up on the Cubs a long time ago. And the, and, and the miracle. To, 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 it's a place where it is always winter and never Christmas. It's always cold 
It's, it's, it's an image of the brokenness of life, of the frigidity of human existence. But what happens when Aslan, who is the Christ figure, lands? What starts happening? Spring starts coming. Right, the thaw starts taking place. That's the kingdom. That, that's God landing and saying everything's going to start changing starting now. Humans can change. You can change. I am overwhelmed by how flawed I am. But I am overwhelmed how much better I am than I used to be. Why? Because the thaw has happened. Jesus Christ has forgiven our sins. He's taken up residency in our lives through the Holy Spirit and got to admit I'm getting better, a little better all the time. He can't get no worse, I admit. <laughs> Paul McCartney and John Lennon understood this, all right? That's one of their songs. We're getting better. And it's easy to say, well, maybe we are sometimes, but I tend to fall back. One step forward, two steps back. Anyone in that one? Yeah, that's me. That's me. I'm just glad for the step forward because we're still making a little progress here. <laughs> but the promise is that one day there'll be no wrong left in me. I won't even be able to imagine sin, much less do it. That's because we have been born again by God. Incidentally, if you haven't been, if you haven't experienced what it is to confess your sins and ask Jesus Christ to make you new inside, you haven't lived. Please, even today, come down and see us or go out to the uh, welcoming desk out there and just ask for some information because you can start getting new because the kingdom of God is making everything new in us and in the world. And that's what launches right here. The gospel of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Now, how does he get this news out of the kingdom? Again, in our text it says, he was teaching and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom everywhere. And he was healing every disease and sickness. He was preaching, teaching, and healing every disease and sickness. Preaching teaching, healing, every disease and sickness. What I use for that is two words. The gospel of the kingdom began to spread through words and works. Good words and good works. Words and works. Words and works. Words and works. Listen, I am so glad God has given human beings language. I am so glad that we can talk and we can write, and that truth that enhances life is ours and available to us because of words. Sometimes, we, those of us that are Christian people, we tend to think, I'm not very good at the words, so I'll just try to do the good works. Can't, can't do it. <laughs> got to have words. You've got to be able to... Listen, you can be the coolest, most wonderful person in the whole world, serving the poor, loving your neighbors, uh, enduring the 49ers during this deep time of sorrow. <laughs> you can just be the coolest person. But if people don't know it's because of Jesus Christ in you, they're going to worship you, not God. It's got to have words. I, I still remember Marie and I I've been married 37 years now, and my queen and I uh, were in Jerusalem 37 years ago, actually 38 and a half because, uh, yeah, l l let me just go on. Uh, <laughs> we were standing at the garden tomb of the resurrection of Jesus Christ in Jerusalem under a full moon, and I thought she liked me, and she thought I liked her. I even wondered if she loved me, and she wondered if I loved her. But standing at that, it's a beautiful red gate. Hope you get to go there sometime. I finally just, I just had to say it. Marie, I love you. And she responded, oh, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. She said, I love you. It took words. Truth is always communicated through language, okay? It, 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 we should have known this from the first chapter of the Bible. 
God created the heavens and the earth through what? Words. God spoke. Boom. God spoke. Boom. Eleven times in the first chapter of Genesis, God speaks life into existence. And, and brothers and sisters, God speaks the new birth into people's lives through words. So every one of us needs to, to be committed to telling the story of how God has changed our life through Jesus Christ to other people. That's all I'm saying. Starts with words. Words, teaching, proclamation. And then it says good works. It was also good works. And in this case, it was not just, if you will, going to Mexico or going to Haiti or, or going to uh, 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 areas even here in the Monterey Valley where people have great need. It, it was certainly that, but it also even came down to healing of diseases and sickness. And notice, it says uh, uh, that, that, that he healed every disease and sickness. 100% success rate when he prayed for healing. And you go, well, why didn't that still happen? I mean, why is it that when I pray for healing, at best, one out of 10 uh, get healed, at best? Why, why was it 100%? Now, here's what you don't say, and a lot of people do, but this is poor theology. The reason it happened more then is because that was Jesus in your lawn. That's wrong. Because Jesus is now in me and you. So it wouldn't be because of that. There's something else going on. We don't know all the reasons why. Some people get healed and some don't. Just two years ago when I was here at, at, at the first time at Shoreline and involved in this conference, Marie was with me and we went down to be with her dad who had a little condo right on the Monterey Bay there and with, uh, with Carol, his wife. Had a lovely afternoon. Little did we know that when we were there in November of 2014, that by early 2015 he would come down with a vicious cancer and we certainly didn't know that he would die just two months ago. But boy, did we pray that he wouldn't. Just like you do. And he did. What's it all about? I don't know all the ins and outs. I do know this. He is healed. <laughs> yeah, he knew Jesus. The end of it, he had kind of wandered away through the whole process of the illness. He comes closer and closer to God. And his own son reaffirmed with his dad through words and prayer of him uh, reestablishing his life with Jesus. So he is healed. It's just not here. I was in the uh, Middle East a couple years ago and talking with, uh, I took three other pastors from our church. And we were sitting in Bethlehem in a beautiful home, um, kind of a and b and we were talking with two missionaries, one a Jew, Jewish man, who'd come to vibrant faith in Christ, and one a Palestinian from Gaza, who'd come to vibrant faith in Christ. And as you know, Jews and Palestinians, especially in Gaza, are enemies, right? Not in Christ, they're not, because he's making all things new. So they're the best of friends, and they're planting small churches all over Israel. And these guys are bright, bright-minded, so we're sitting learning from them. And they keep talking about healing as if it's a normal part of what they do. And I finally said, Sean, hold it. You're, you're talking like physical healing's happening a lot here. And I said, how much is it happening? And he goes, well, I don't know. Wael, how much do you think it's happening? And Wael goes, well, I don't know. We don't, we've never really tried to quantify it. And then Sean goes, I, I would guess it's about 45 or 50% of the time. What do you think, Wael? And he goes... Yeah, I, I think that's about right. And I go, what? One out of every two? What? But then they, here's what they did. They quickly said, oh, but that's only if we're praying for people that don't know Jesus yet. People apart from God are getting healed at a 50% rate. He says, if it's a Christian, it's no more than 5%. And that felt kind of topsy-turvy to me, you know? Hey, we're the good guys, you know? <laughs> but then the more I thought about it, that's true there. It's probably true in other places. If so, what's behind it? 
And here's what it is. If you're a Christian, despite bodily illness and affliction that you have, you've already been healed for eternity. And so the brief sliver of existence of these 80 plus years on life compared to eternity where your wellness is more than you've ever imagined is already taken care of. That's why Jesus would often do miracles and they would be called signs. A sign points to something else, doesn't it? And so God often uses powerful healings and visions and dreams. We baptized 10 Muslims in our church last night who have all come to vibrant faith in Jesus Christ. Three of the 10 have had vibrant dreams and visions of seeing Jesus. Why? They're signs pointing so that they get eternal healing too. That's the best I got on it. So the gospel comes in good words and it comes in good works. All right? Now, let's, let's keep going here. Let's keep going here. As it goes on, it says in verse 36, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and they were helpless and they were like sheep without a shepherd. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed, they were helpless, they were like sheep with no shepherd. Each one of those terms is vitally important. The word harassed, when Jesus uses it in that text, it, it literally means to be tormented. When Jesus looked at people, he saw them as tormented, beat up on every side. No matter where they turned, the afflictions of life, the, the, the afflictions, the perplexions, the persecutions, the, the crisis that, that come at us, that's how he saw people. I'm glad he saw us that way because that's what life really is, right? I remember when Marie and I moved into... Uh, uh, we moved to Chicago. And some people say, why did you leave California to go to Chicago? I said, because God got mad at us, I think. That, that's a... <laughs> and I believe in grace, but I'm still hoping. Uh, that's why I accept every invitation to speak in California I can. And I said, can we come back now, Lord? Yeah. All right. Aside. Okay. So we buy a house in, in this lovely communi bedroom community of Chicago. And I'm not kidding you guys, you wouldn't be able to experience this unless you've been there. All the lawns are green without sprinklers. And the summer, it's warm and there's this lovely humidity which reminds you of being in the womb. That's what I think humidity is. <laughs> and, and as we drove down this one street, there was a little parkway. So you had your front yard all green, then a sidewalk and another 12 to 15 feet of grass. And on every parkway in front of every house was a gas lantern. And it was dusk when we drove down the street. And, and the trees were bending over the road. Have I done it now? Do you see it? And I thought, is this heaven? And Marie said, no, this is Palatine, Illinois. But it was like a fairy tale. I mean, it was a vision of fairy tale. And, and it's the place where all the men are handsome. All the women are strong and all the children are above normal intelligence. It's Lake Wobegon. I mean, it's, it's just... <gasps> we could live here and we bought a house there. We wanted to move into the fairy tale. Only to find out it wasn't a fairy tale. It was a horror film. <laughs> because our problems didn't go away. And as we got to know our neighbors... This was, this was an upstanding upper middle class area. I mean, you were known by your car and the quality of your snow thrower. <laughs> Here, let me explain what snow is to you. <laughs> but Tom and Ann, right across the street, Tom was so rich he had his own private airplane too. Uh, but as we got to know him, one, one night Tom and I were both bringing our garbage out to the street and as we did so, because even really rich people have to take their garbage out. It's the coolest thing. <laughs> and we just started talking about life. And I don't know how it came up. But he shared about how about five years earlier. Their precious college age son. Uh, was uh, training 
to be a, a cyclist, actually hoping to make the Olympics, was hit by a hit and run driver and killed. And he still couldn't forgive whoever it was that did, did it and didn't own up. I go, whoa. Right next to Tom and Ann, Greg and Cheryl, beautiful, wonderful family. Uh, Cheryl's pregnant at the same time Marie's pregnant. And in our neighborhood, you, you redo the nursery for every child because that makes their lives better. Okay. <laughs> But they weren't getting the new nursery going. And when we had them over to dinner and we finally started talking about real life, real stuff, found out that they were scared, scared, scared about this baby because the last baby that had been born to them died of sudden infant death syndrome. Not supposed to happen. They have a BMW. <laughs> Come our side of the street, go down three, Dave and Hope, great husband and wife, great father and mother. Hope's probably the most astounding mother I ever saw and still worked as a surgical nurse on the side. She loved her children, cared for them, etc., etc. One time over for dinner as they're telling us about their lives and we're telling them about ours, we find out Hope said, I want to be the best mom I can ever be because I lived through as a teenage daughter seeing my dad kill my mother and then turn the gun on himself. This isn't a place of parkways and gas lamps. When Jesus saw the world, that's what he saw. Do you? The second word, helpless, helpless. Harassed, tormented on every side, helpless. Th that word means as good as dead, mortally wounded. And we know what Jesus means by that, right? What he saw was that every human being, regardless of how tall they were, how handsome they were, what color they were, etc., etc., he saw a mortal wound in every human soul that sin has caused and that can only be healed by him shedding his blood for them and them receiving the gift of his healing. And that creates an urgency. Tormented on every side of life, harassed, helpless, as good as dead, mortally wounded, unless the inner soul is made new by Jesus Christ's shed blood. That's what he saw. And then the third thing he says, they're like sheep without a shepherd. You know what it doesn't say there? They're like stallions. <laughs> he doesn't say they're like buffalo. Powerful. The ground shakes when they run. He's another sheep. Docile and dumb. That's a sheep are. Helpless. A, 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 a sheep will get into a thicket and not have the intelligence to know how to get out. That's why they have to have a shepherd. A sheep will walk to the edge of the cliff and says, this looks fun, and go right over. That's why they need a shepherd. Any predator will destroy a sheep like that. They have no defenses. That's why they need a shepherd. And so when Jesus took his people in the van to the mission field, he helped them to see people as harassed, helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. And then it says, and then he had compassion. And that's Shelley Allen. We have to do something and so God comes in the flesh dies for sin rises from the dead ascends to the father and leaves his church to move the kingdom into every crack and crevice and neighborhood and workplace of this world because people are harassed dying and are sheep unless the new birth of Jesus Christ takes them and so I say to you what Jesus ends it with we just have to pray because he said the harvest is ready out there it's just that we're not going with our words and our works so he said pray and we'll pray with him now 2,000 years later please bow with me So, Lord, thank you for letting us stay here. Even at times, we'd rather go to heaven. And thank you for making our lives new in Jesus 
and giving us a calling to spread his message of new lives and a new world. And I pray for everyone here that you'll give them hope today if they're feeling harassed. And I pray for everyone today that you'll give them a friend, a relative, a neighbor or two that they need to bring the life-giving message of Jesus to. This I pray in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ, Lord of heaven and earth. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Lon. What a wonderful message.